Less than 30 seconds now in regulation. Could this take extra time? 16 seconds. Here's Dial. Send it up to point J. Lalu. Call Midget now, but Matt, six seconds, five. Dalfan coming out. He gets around in two seconds. He's got to do it quick. Shoot the scores. One second left. Ah, man. We're back face off kind of thing something like that yeah the uh, adaptation of it anyway it's only been a year well look man I think uh, the last one I did was season 12 maybe I think it was season 12 I'm not really sure yeah. to be totally honest with you but I think it was season 12 but anyway, uh, yeah, so we're, we're back, and we're going to do something a little different than what those of you who used to watch the show uh, will remember. Um, instead, going to focus specifically on player interviews, so I'm going to be doing a, a series of these where I'm going to sit down for a, a much uh, longer interview with a member from the community. This time around, it's going to be everybody's favorite, Dalfan. What's going on? I Dalfan? am. Let's make it clear, I am not everybody's favorite. Uh, you are definitely everybody's favorite. I think if you took, I think more than 50% of the community has a negative view of me. That's okay. You're a polarizing figure. Yes. People is... care about you. Whether or not they like you, they care about you. I'm I'm relevant. That That is true. Let's Even be, though you I'm don't just, play anymore. I'm just a washed up player now. <laughs> I got nothing special going on. All I'm here is to talk about the old days, you know, back in my day, bit. season four, back when the good players played. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right, so we'll uh, we'll get into this. I'm not going to live stream these. Uh, well, at least I'm not intending on live streaming them. Maybe in the future we'll do that. But, uh, yeah, not planning on live streaming them. And Dick Doug is, is pretty much gone, so I don't think prom? he's going to be a... Well, he, he is today, so I hope he has a good time at prom with his lovely girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever he's with right now. Shout out um, to Abby, Dick Doug's girlfriend. Is it Abby? Okay. It is there Abby. You know. There we go. Yeah. Now you know. Yeah. So yeah, rest in peace, Dick Doug. No longer with us. Maybe at some point in the future. Maybe I'll do an interview with him. Oh, God, that'd be terrible. Yes. Could you I imagine? Concur. Like, with how little he paid attention during the original show, like, if it was all about him answering questions, it'd be awful. He'd have no idea what's going on. Huh? What? Me? Right. Like, what? <laughs> oh, what's the question? <laughs> Let's get oh, we went through Let's way get too much of that. All right. All right. Enough, enough jokes about the but old yeah. show. First guest ever, Dalfan. Dalfan, welcome to the uh, the first iteration of the Face Off interview series. I gotta come Ooh. up with a better name for it. Reband. Think of something. So, but yeah, uh, so Dalfan's here with us, and he's somebody who I wanted to get early on in this series because he meant a lot for me in my career, not just as a friend, but in terms of helping me develop into the player that I am today. A lot of my personal achievements came either playing with him or as a result of me having played with him. So I have a lot to be thankful to him for, and he's one of the most decorated players in LHL history and arguably the most successful, at least in in my eyes and you can take a look at a lot of that on the screen here i know Dolph, unfortunately you can't see this so I'll, I'll read it off to everyone watching and you as well so Dolph's played for 13 seasons in the lhl he's not playing currently he played forward seasons one through three then switched to goalie for seasons four through eight and then played defense seasons nine through 13. He's one of the only people to ever play all three positions at an lhl level i think maybe ace May have done that as well, um, but pickle box probably as well. Yeah, but I don't think any of the or I don't think either of them uh, played all three positions for at least a full season. I think they had sort of small stints at those other positions. Oh, that's fair. As opposed to extended, you know, in this case for you, you've got at least three seasons in every position, and for defense and goalie, five seasons in each of those. 
Um, you're also the first person to really master playing left defense and turn the left defenseman into a, a meaningful position because before that, a lot of people <laughs> really had trouble playing off their backhand. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do at all. So uh, you were the person who sort of defined the left D meta, I guess you could call it. Yeah, I actually remember going into the first season, like not the first season playing defense, but first season like trying to r break records. And I kind of came to the conclusion that it wouldn't be possible just because every other precedent had been a right defenseman and no one in left defense had really done anything, let alone like even lead their team in points. So like it was just something and maybe it's just all the good players preferred right defense or something like that. They just preferred to take forehand shots, that kind of thing. So it makes it look worse than it actually was. But like, I don't know. I'm sure that's a big part of it. I mean, we've got some other good left defensemen now. Like, I see, I think, usually plays left defense. BG as well, primarily a left defenseman. Um, but a lot of the people, Taser, really, most by most people, considered to be the number one defenseman in NHL history, at least for most of it anyway, uh, primarily played on the right or prefers to play on the right. So and I think Zam prefers to play on the right as well, guys like Big V. They'll play on both sides, but I think most of them usually default to the right. You were the first one that really preferred it to be on the left, I think, or at least made yourself at home on the left. So, yeah, and then you know what? One of the really nice aspects of being preferred on the left side was then you could bring in a rookie or you know someone else to play, and they'd get to play on a more comfortable, easy spot on the right side to where they're kind of used to. Whereas other places, like a good RSL defenseman, would get called up, and then they'd have to play on the left side when they're get used to playing on the right side. So then you know, it, it just makes it even harder on them to make that transition. So to be able to put, you know, someone who's trying to learn the game on the right side, it was just made everything easier, especially when you're having to deal with, like, when I was GMing, like, oh, it was just so much, it made, made everything a lot more convenient, but yeah, off topic kind of little tangent. No, for sure. I mean, that, that was a huge part of having such a reliable left defenseman to work with, so... Uh, but getting back into sort of you as a, as a player and your career, uh, you can see on the screen here we got the career player statistics. So Dalf in uh, 130 games as a skater, feels like a lot. Uh, you got uh, 210 points and you were plus 43, 97 goals, 113 assists, and 15 game-winning goals. I had 97. I didn't get to 100. No, I you did not. At 97. Yep, you did. Oh, geez. What about? Oh, Jesus. Is that just, that's obviously just 5v5. So I think that's both 5v5 and 4v4 together. Well, I didn't... Okay, that's fair. You did early on in the, the first couple of seasons, 1 through 3 a little bit. Yeah. Um, but anyway, as a goalie, very good. just under a 62% save rate, uh, 3.26 goals against average, and in, that was in 86 games played. A lot of that was in 4v4, it's worth mentioning, or at least like half of that was in 4v4, which is why the save percentage and the goals against average are a little bit lower than you might expect. A lot um, of breakaways. Yes. Yes, when there's only one defenseman, is a big difference. Uh, you appeared in eight LHL finals, which is the most uh, that anybody has ever appeared in uh, as a player or a GM. And you also missed the playoffs only one time in the 13 seasons that you played. So shout out to the Hartford Whalers. Season six, season that uh, you took off, right? Yeah. <laughs> that, I don't, you know, I don't remember that one, actually. What, you hold, when was that again? Uh, it would have been 2015, I think, beginning of 2015. I don't. No, it don't still, not, still doesn't ring a bell. Sorry. It took that year off. I think I, I think I blacked that one out actually. Ah, uh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you hold uh, a few more distinctions there too. Uh, only defenseman to ever lead his team in points. Only defenseman to ever lead his team in goals, and one of three defensemen to ever lead the league in assists. Uh, the other two being Taze and McJaba. So. One of those the, uh, is good company. <laughs> Java, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you've also been one of the most successful GMs that we've ever had in the LHL. Uh, you GMed for 90 regular season games over the course of four seasons. In that time, you had a just under 58% win rate and jammed for 39 postseason games where you had a 66.67% win rate and you succeeded in never missing the finals in a season that you GM'd, which wow. is pretty fucking crazy to think about. So you were a top two team in every season that you were a GM. Hmm. 
Uh, you're also the only GM to ever win a cup while not starting for his team. Oh, is that actually true? Yeah. Oh, huh, I didn't know that. So ever? that's yeah. Huh. Yeah. So there you go. I, that's that's pretty impressive. It, it might sound fact. it might sound not impressive to begin with, uh, because you know he wasn't starting, <laughs> but. <laughs> To have a team that is good enough to not need Delph on the ice to win is huge, and that says a lot about his ability to, to put a team together, which is why I, I really wanted to, to point that out. Uh, yeah, so looking I, at... Sorry, oh, I, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, I think a lot of GMs wouldn't either A, make the move that would cause them to be benched, or B, recognize that their team is better without them on the ice. Like, I think that's like kind of a hard thing to realize. So then yeah. that also might cause um, that to not have happened before, you know? Yep. Most people want to play the game. <laughs> to be fair, you were a Sorry. starter for most of the regular season, but in the yeah. playoffs, I think you played like a couple minutes of a game or two, I think while uh, while Briz was gone or something like that. Um, but that Didn't was I skate? pretty much it. You skated for Dick Doug because Dick Doug had to go eat at some point. I think that was the moment I realized that I wanted to be a defenseman. Was when he he had to go grab some food or something. Oh my god. In the goodness. middle of like game four. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, okay. And I was kind of happy about it though, because I was like, oh fuck yeah, this will be fun. I think we gave up a goal. <laughs> you were plus zero, so huh. over the course of the two games you played in that playoff run. So if yeah. we gave up a goal there, we got another one back while you were on the ice, so Nice. Worked out well in the end. I don't have time on ice for that season, unfortunately. Wish I did, but I'm pretty sure you didn't play more than like two periods max in the playoffs. So, yeah. and again, that was purely as a backup. Um, so, looking at some of the awards you've won and some of the records you have, you're an eight-time LHO All-Star, five-time Legends Cup winner, three-time Coolixer Cup winner. Legends Cup is LHO Finals winner. Coolixer Cup is the team with the best record. You're a three times. Uh, Tim Barrett Trophy winner, it's defenseman with the most points. Three times Taser Trophy winner, best defenseman. Three times, this is the big one, Bo Jarzin Award winner for perfect attendance. And then you've won each of the following awards once. The Cryptic C Cup, which is uh, regular season MVP. Crab and a Tree Trophy, most assists. Iskin Award, best team play. Tickle Box Trophy is, I think, best save percentage, or it's best goals against average, and then I think the Briz Memorial Trophy is best save percentage, and then one best GM award, uh, the t Lores Award. And as far as records go, they all happen to be goalie related, but you have the lowest goals against average in a 5v5 season, second highest save percentage in a 5v5 season, uh, highest. highest saves per game in a 5v5 postseason run, you have the second highest save percentage in a 5v5 postseason run, only beaten by Fat Squirrels like 83% or whatever he had. Just bullshit. Uh, the second highest <laughs> saves per game in a 4v4 season, and then the highest career saves per game in 4v4 seasons. And again, the, both of the bottom two uh, might not sound super impressive immediately, but you got to consider only one defenseman at the time so there were a ton of breakaways and one-on-one -on -one opportunities so being good back then was a lot harder than being good now as a goalie yeah and that season that fat squirrel beat my save percentage in the playoffs he was doping so i don't know if that counts <laughs> uh, i think generally that should be stripped from him but you know and then lastly i know it's not written here but you were uh, one of two defensemen to ever win the season mvp alongside taser in season six Oh, so, what year did I? What year was that? Season twelve, I think. Right, you got oh. MVP. Did I? Yep, pretty sure you did. Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> that highlights you <laughs> as a player in your career and a lot of what you've been through. And I mean, that's a that's a wealth of achievements there. Most people won't get anywhere close to that in their entire lifetime playing this game. So yeah, I, th I think you forgot some stuff, but don't worry about it. That's right. You can uh, you can fill in the blanks later on. But yeah, you've got I think it's like 15 individual awards, like six records or I guess three first place records, three second place ones, eight times uh, all star, five times you won the cup, eight times you're in the finals. I mean, just ridiculous.
So personally, I think your career should be celebrated a bit more than it is, but we don't really do too much of that for anybody, I guess, in this game. So maybe that's something we should uh, all appreciate more. But yeah, so we'll get into the interview questions now that we've sort of uh, set the table here. Um, and I want to start really basic with it. Uh, how did you first discover HQM? Um, so I guess like when I was a kid, when I was a, a tween, when I was a teenager, when I was 15, what, 16? Um, I played a whole bunch of fucking NHL, like 09, 11, 12, you know, the EA sport. And so I would browse the EA NHL. And then one, it was 2013, and Dick Van Deek posted on that subreddit talking about how he had just discovered a game a few months ago, really liked it, and, you know, I stumbled upon it, and I downloaded the game, and I played it. And obviously I was, I was really bad. Um, but it was like kind of captivating at the same time. It was like kind of entertaining, like just kind of a quirky game. Really like I, I really wanted to get better, you know, but also at the same time, no one played it. At the time, the only thing that was really there was like the upcoming 3v3 tournament that Cryptic C was trying to put on. And it was like, I think it might still be on his website. or I'm sure he took it down after he did the, the uh, prototype, whatever, but um, for like three years that was up there about the 3v3 tournament, <laughs> and which never came to fruition, but everyone talked about it, and everyone who had just discovered the game between guys like DVD and Tic Tac and, 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 and whoever else, um, and as well as guys who were just coming in, everyone wanted to try and get better for this 3v3 tournament that was coming on, and that's kind of how I found the game. And then shortly after, I guess it's kind of important to talk about, was then I liked it so much that I wanted more people to play it. I thought it was cool. Um, and there wasn't really enough. There was like the just the HQML. Um, and it wasn't really like, it was, it was like really, season one was really competitive. But it was at the same time still completely laissez fair, just build your own team. Teams would smash other teams, whatever. And so <clears throat> I wanted more people to play it, and I wanted more people to... Like, I think at the time I was trying to make like a national development team or something like that. Yep. Um, and so I was trying to get more people to play it, and I posted on our hockey, which is now known as like the post, because um, it brought in probably the most we've ever gotten of wave of players that still play to this day. It's kind of ridiculous. And, and most importantly, brought in the man Dialoriax, which is probably one of the only reasons the community is still alive to this day. So that's kind of how it happened. So probably based on either DVD's post recruiting me, which then my post recruiting Dial, which then Dial's posts, which he didn't really make a post himself, but eventually coordinated a bunch of posts to recruit. At some point, it all links back to DVD, and it's his fault why you're playing this game now. And so you can thank him for that, or you can thank me. It's you know one of the well, you're here. Don't forget, you're here forever. So um, I found the game. <laughs> well, there we go. I mean, that's a good introduction for a lot of people that play now that probably don't know anything about that. Um, that's actually probably pretty cool to hear sort of the origins where a lot yeah, of that it was, came from. It was just Russians, really. And yeah. it was Europeans, and then there was, like, barely anyone. And basically, in order to get a game going, you had to, like, post on a form somewhere. What was it? Uh, that one that one form that it was originally on, it has, like, the, the face. Um, a face punch, right? Is that what it's called? Yeah, face punch. Yep. You'd have to go on there and be like, hey, anyone playing tonight? And, like, maybe you get, like, eight people on for a 4v4 match, because everyone played 4v4 back then, or 3v3 and you'd get to play one game, and then that was it. I mean, we and... take it for granted now, but there, there are pubs pretty much, as soon as like you get to early afternoon, mid-afternoon, there's pretty much a pub or something close to a full pub going on at almost all points of the day until like 3 a.m. Eastern time, so. Yeah, and it wasn't like that before, unless you wanted Not to even play close. with some... Even the Russian community wasn't. I mean, it was just a very scarce game, and so it's kind of ironic. The amount of the, the amount of time that Cryptic put into it was inversely related to how many people were playing. <laughs> so when no one played the game, he was actually developing it a bit, and then as people joined, he kind of t tapered off, and then as a whole bunch of people got here, he died. <laughs> unfortunate. Very unfortunate, but that... <sighs> 
we can get into that in another uh, <laughs> show, another episode, whatever the case is. But we'll keep focusing on you and your career. So um, I guess sort of as a, as a follow up to what you spoke about, and I think you touched on it a little bit already. But what was it about this game that really captured your attention and, and kept you here for as long as you've been here for? Um, I guess. Do you remember? Do you remember Super Bowl that game? Yep. Um, that you had the little like laser ball. It was kind of before Rocket League's time. I think Rocket League was kind of loosely based. Like they kind of saw that game and then they built Rocket League and Rocket League made millions and Super Bowl made nothing. But Super Bowl had a trailer and I think they put it really best. Is they described like the games that EA built makes between FIFA, Chell, and and MLB and whatever else. The the things in those games are all at some point RNG based. And not to say that there's no RNG in HQM, but for the most part, everything that you do, when you shoot the puck wrong, it when you take a long shot and it misses, it's your fault. And something about that, I just like fucking, I love the amount of control that you had in the game. On top of the movement of this game, I think is one of the most underrated parts about HQM. And it's, it's funny because it's actually unintentional. I'm pretty sure the fact that when you look at the sky and turn faster, that's just... Like yeah, an no accident. way that was an intended feature, yeah. <laughs> but it's amazing how much that single fact, that single feature has caused, has, has created the ability for a competitive scene in this game. Because without that, God, the game sucks. And I feel bad for anyone who played this game and never discovered that. Because, fuck, I mean, like, the game feels like 6-2 unless you know that. Unless you know yeah. how to skate properly, maintain your momentum, that kind of thing. And so between all those things, like, the game was just like, this perfect accident. <laughs> That's probably why I'm still playing. And also, one of the things before, like nowadays, uh, and everybody shits all over the community and talks about how the community is, oh, we play that game, but if not for the community. But like, I'll be honest, season six or season five, season four even, no, season five to 10, like, that was like a point in my life when, like, I don't I think it was like a freshman in college. I wasn't like super happy. Like, and HQM was like, it's kind of like embarrassing to say, but like, it was like, it was such an important, like, like not validation, but like just support group really. And it was that community that was just like so invaluable for me at that time. And like, I wasn't even that stud of a play. Like I was a good goalie, I guess. Like, and then eventually like, but like from season six to season 10, I don't know that many communities small tight knit like this that would get together in Boston and all hang out and get a hotel room and and make memories like that like I like so one of the reasons why I'm still here not so much now maybe one of the reasons why I kind of have fallen off but from season six to season probably 10 or 11 those were just like kind of golden years of HQM community for me and I just absolutely adored it so that's that's one of the reasons why I stuck around that's awesome to hear. I mean, I, I think I agree. I think a lot of people would agree that that was probably the best period, maybe not just for you, and maybe this is just a coincidence, but I think for the LHL in general, really, like once we sort of shifted to 5v5 um, and then building up through like season 11 or so, and I mean, even past that, it hasn't been necessarily bad, but those have definitely been the, the peak years of the LHL. So, but that's awesome to hear that you had such a great experience with it. And I think a lot of people sort of underrate that. And, you know, a lot of us joke about, oh, I wish the game wasn't here anymore. So I didn't have to play this shit anymore. But <laughs> in reality, it's like, it might not be the game. It might be the community around it. But it's what brings us all here together. And that is actually pretty special. Absolutely, yeah. I love all right, it. So- We'll uh, we'll dive into some more specific questions about about you and your career and some things that happened to you. Uh, so we'll start off with this: Why did you stop being a GM despite all the success you had, constantly making the finals, even when it it felt like your team wasn't even necessarily like good enough to get there? Like, what made you decide to stop doing it? Um, I guess for me, um, like season seven, um. I was kind of like the first, one of the first GMs to really apply like a really good team-based strategy. Before then, it was really just fling a couple players together to make a roster, give them certain tips, but what is the system? I don't know. So then like for that, like I was the first kind of person to do that. And as enough players kind of 
ended up on my team, figured out how the best way to play was, and then ended up on other teams, I kind of lost my edge. So then I had every other team was playing a similar strategy as me to where um, it wasn't as easy to maintain that top spot. Um, and so it was kind of easier to just take a step back and not worry about it. I mean, like, I think, I can't remember, season eight, was I a GM? Yeah, so season seven, season eight, season nine. And then, like, when I didn't three-peat, I kind of wanted to take a step back, I guess. But, like, the big thing was that a couple, at, at certain times, like, I would make a move at the end of the year, at the trade deadline, and it kind of, like, I got a really bad rep for being shady and being kind of slight. I felt like I was kind of being, like, like, um, not like targeting the system. It kind of like I felt guilty at certain times, but at the same time, I also felt like I was kind of being like like mis uh misconstrued. Like all all I was trying to do was just create the best team that I I had and make my team the best chance of of winning the cup. And but at the same time, there were certain decisions that were really really difficult. Like trading a player away at the trade deadline who had played for your your team the whole year, um, very hard to do when, especially when you're a top team and you're looking to make that extra move to 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 be a winner to be a cup winner. Yep. Um, really hard to do because this isn't. It's not like this is the NHL to where you can just be like, sorry, man, that you have a contract and this is a business. It's not. It's just a. It's just a game. You. It's just an extracurricular type, you know, thing that you play with your friends to have fun. Um, and so to trade someone away, you know, you kind of build bad blood. Like the amount of times I traded Otto at the fucking deadline, I feel horrible <laughs> about. <laughs> um, and so like, there's certain really tough things to do with being a GM. You're held to a higher standard. You can't, you can't screw around, um, as much. Um, and it's exhausting really, especially when you have Lucic, I mean, what on your team, um, <laughs> so there are certain you know at some point it's just you want to take a step back and you just want to be like i don't know i don't know i'm just here to play <laughs> like because and also probably one of the big things was it was four straight cup finals or no three straight cup finals and i just knew that i wouldn't be able to do it a fourth time i feel like i didn't think that i'd be able to um with the with the format of the draft and everything, it felt like it'd be easier just to let someone else draft me. Yep. You know, it's that's just always been kind of not a loophole, but you know, it's just a tough thing to balance. So that was another one of the things. It was just easier to, you know, that season I had on California was like just such a coast job. So that was fun, and, and I didn't have to worry. You didn't have to stress about about your team or about managing everyone, making sure everyone's going to show up. But fuck. Private messaging everyone, be like, "Hey, you gonna be here tonight?" Like, what a freaking nightmare! So, that was just, you know, I don't think anyone can do it that long. Cause anyone, I know Zam did it for a really long time, but like, it's exhausting. Even when you're yeah. winning. Yeah, for sure. It, let alone if you had a losing season, God. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> and keeping everyone happy. Oh, jeez. Always a pain, for sure. Yes. So building off that a little bit then, uh, if you had the chance, what would you change about the LHL or what would you change about maybe GMing and the way that uh, GMs are allowed to maneuver or make trades or uh, build their team or whatever? What what kind of changes would you make? Um, I don't know. Like My dream, like this is unrealistic, but ideally I would love to be able to have like so many players to where you could actually have like lines and like 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 pairings and and have enough players to actually have a team as opposed to just the five man like unit but realistically that would never happen do you remember that one season when we tried shifts <laughs> where yeah. players would play 30 seconds and get off play 30 i think we tried it for the preseason or something it didn't work at all because you couldn't find a groove but like i would love to have it be something like that to where you could actually have roles you could actually have people like who would hit i don't know so but in terms of format, realistic format changes, I don't know. Like everything's already been thought out so so much, and the the best thing is basically been put into place. It's just at some point, after years and years of doing it, it gets kind of boring after a while. 
there's only so many different players you can play with. There's only so many different scenarios that can happen. Um, and so I don't know that I could, I, like, I can't, I don't have one, like, golden egg to, to present and be like, if we did this, everything would be different. It's not, like, the auction. I don't, I just, it, but ideally, if I could change anything, I'd just make more players. Because uh, could you imagine having 30, 30 team season, you know, uh, 30 team league that'd be so much fun to where you yeah. just have no idea what's coming at you so many different players but you know i'm out here hoping for a 10 team league two five team <laughs> divisions i think that'd be really cool yeah you know? even eight again would be just great but you know the amount of burnout that we get is equivalent to how many new players we come in if we're lucky so just really hard to maintain all right, so we spoke a little bit earlier about how you've played all three roles in the LHL uh, for at least three seasons in every single role. Uh, so what prompted you to switch away from forward into goalie in season four and then away from goalie to defense in season nine? Um, so it was leading up to the draft. I was a forward, but I was never good enough. Like I played season one, but I was a GM, so I'd play other player. There were other players who were better than me, whether they were veterans or whether they were, you know, like DVD at the time was better than me. A guy named Tic Tac, who was like this stud before everyone else showed up, was a bit better than me. Nando, those kind of guys were just better than me. So I would play off and on, but I was never really that good, to be honest, as a forward. And then season two, I took off because we lost in the finals and. Dick McButts was salty, and I was salty with him because we were immature, and we were like, eh, screw the LHL. We we won in HKML anyway. We beat that team, so why does everyone care about the LHL now? And just because they won, now that's, that's the league that's important. No one even remembers that we beat them before. Because like, the two teams were identical, and they played in the finals in both leagues. And then me and Dick McButts won in HKML, and then we played again in the LHL finals, and we lost. <laughs> and then the LHL was the league that was important. And we were like, we were salty. So anyway, we took off season two. Season three came around. I played as four, but I was back up with goalies to go on Montreal. We won the cup, but I didn't really do much. I, I like, I said I was the coach, but I don't even. I think I missed games three and four. So like, what kind of shitty coach was I? Um, so then season four came around, and I think it was like leading up to the draft, and I was just playing, and I was, I had Taser shooting on me, and I was just making save after save, and at the time, like, it was so weird to me because I remember just being awestruck at like tickle box and his ability to make saves like i never even i never understood how he did it but i was making saves and i was like hey you think i could be a goalie and and taze is like taze needed a goalie at the time he was like holy shit matt you should draft this guy as our goalie and so some some out of some retarded decision they decided to draft me this bad forward as their starting goaltender and somehow we won the cup <laughs> as a rookie goaltender um, who had never even played a pub as a goalie, let alone a <laughs> competitive game. But it worked, and I, I was a starter as a goalie, which is something that I, like, I struggled to obtain as a forward, and I still can't do for some reason. Just the skating forward and receiving behind me, I will never understand. Um, <laughs> and even though you said like I've done all three positions, I still rest that I will never be able to be a successful LHL forward. No matter, even if I have Matt next to me, it will never happen for me just because I can't ever position properly. Um, so that's how I ended up playing goalie. And we won the cup. We didn't track goalie stats back then, but I swear to God, I had like a 78 save percentage. Um, we had actually, we started tracking goalie stats, but we just didn't keep track of playoff stats because back then was still when... GMs were responsible for participating in stat collection, and most GMs were all right at that during the regular season, but in the playoffs, nobody ever gave us anything, so we just stopped keeping track of them for the playoffs until, like, season five, so. Yeah, I remember I kept track of it on my own, a little notepad, and I remember, like, bragging about it. I'd be like, my save percentage is this, but no one will ever know. Anyway, so then I played I played goalie for a while, and then at some point, the problem with goaltending is no matter how good you are, there is still a really high percentage, more more luck base than any other position in the game. Like the amount of times that you make a save and it just bounces off your stick and goes in, or just like like there's so much 
well, there's only so much you can control in both real hockey goaltending and L and HQML goal H U M goaltending. <laughs> um, there's only so much that you can really control, and no matter how confident you are, and no matter how squared to the puck you are, um, and no matter how much you try and know whether or not they're going to ground shot it or what they're going to do. Um, you still have pucks bounce into your own net. You still have people tip pucks by you. Uh, you still get beat just on stuff you shouldn't, no matter how well positioned you are. I don't know how Fat Squirrel had that season that he did. That was insane. Um, but so I think I just wanted something more secure, kind of, to where I felt exhausted because of the amount that you had to practice goaltending in order to stay good. Um, you had to have constantly, and that was the harder thing that. The hard part about it was that you couldn't just practice on your own. You had to have someone shoot on you. So I'd be constantly messaging people going, hey, can you shoot on me? Hey, can you shoot on me? And then you, they came out with that goalie bot thing where people where the thing shoots at you, which is great, but it's on zero ping. So it's not the same. And so you do that all day. And then you go try play LHL and you get beat because your your stick is half a second, you know, a, a fifth of a second late. Um, and it's not the same timing. So then... I just wanted something like that I felt like I could control more. And for me, I finally felt, I think I started coming out season eight. Do you remember that? I started, and I started season getting really a, annoyed. A little bit, yeah. Uh, I'm on, like, on a rant right now, but I started That's getting okay. annoyed yeah. with Dick Doug because his playmaking was so bad season eight that I think we, I started coming out and playing the puck. Um, and that was season eight, right? Dick yeah. Dick was on our team. And yeah. And I started passing up to you, and I realized, hey, I can do this. <laughs> so that's when it kind of like occurred to me that I'm going to try and do this. And it worked out really well. Um, it wasn't – I like you can talk all about how I'm like a good defenseman, but I swear like I still – I don't know how I ever made it as a defenseman because I am not very good. I'm I'm Eric Carlson, man. Everyone says he can't play, def he can't play defense, yet somehow he's still like having a great time. Like, I, I'm not even that good defensively. I just, like, know how to wedge people, and I know how to, like, shove them to the corner, and I know how to, like, just get right in their face and then take their puck away. Like, but one-on-one, -on -one, I swear, like, if I'm just skating at a guy, I'll, I'll lose every time. <laughs> Unless I'm, like, going, you know, at him from an angle or something, or, or like, God. I, I was lucky to have good defensive partners in my career. I not say that much. Anyways, is that... And then, then I retired. Yeah, and yeah, then you then you did. <laughs> so, so looking back at it, you you kind of already touched on it, I think a little. So I, you know, was saying that uh, you had a really difficult time with offense. But I was going to ask which position you thought was the hardest to play and which you preferred to play of the three. God, I just could not play forward. I tried it so many times, like drafts when we get like three goalies and two defensemen, and I'd be like, I'll play forward, and then like we get a. Like, <laughs> We get like two games in, and we scored two goals. <laughs> it was such a bad forward. Like I still can't do it. I don't even know. Like I could probably be an RSL forward. <laughs> but like the worst part about it, like I could actually be a for I could be an NHL forward. But the problem was, I would score more points playing defense than I would as a forward, because of like long shots and breakouts and just puck management. Like. I just didn't get enough touches as a forward. That's why I just couldn't do it. Much better defenseman. And then what was the second part of the question, which part was Which I... you preferred. Definitely defense. Of the three. Just because I feel like I love quarterbacking the play. I love being the first one back and then finding, like just completely exploiting their forecheck, whether you're being crushed and just flinging it off the glass right to a guy. Or like it's so, like I love when I'm being forechecked and you just slide it right under their stick right to like right down the middle of the ice through a breakaway like i don't know i just love that so definitely defensemen long shots and, and and galore although there is a certain just like guilty pleasure of goaltending but it's it ends as soon as you allow a goal so <laughs> all right so we'll shift gears a little bit then away from the positional based questions um and we'll start to look at the nadt so Everyone watching this now will at least probably know of the NADT that happened. I think it was last season, last season or two seasons ago. I can't remember, but um, North American development team that was run by BG. 
And that idea came from Delphin's first attempt at it um, in the LHL of season 10, I think. Yeah, season 10 of the LHL, uh, where you ran a North American development team. And funnily enough, that idea came from back in, before season <laughs> one of the LHL, where you originally wanted to do a development team that sort of fell through. Um, so, But I want to look a little bit more into the actual successful attempt at it in season 10, or at least in my eyes, successful. Um, and I wanted to ask you if you thought the NADT that season was successful, because there's a lot of uh, back and forth over the past few seasons about whether or not the NADT actually did a good job of preparing those players for the future, um, or if those players were just going to naturally move up anyway on their own. Um, I mean, like, I haven't been a part of that many arguments about it. Maybe people, like, kind of taper off and don't bother, like, going, like, oh, the NAGT didn't really do that much, like, to me, because I'm, like, maybe they feel bad about, you know, like, doing that to the guy who tried so hard. So I haven't heard anyone be, like, the NAGT didn't do anything. I was going to make it anyway. Like, but that is certainly true. Like, certain guys, like, like, um, like a guy Lafleur was never part of the NAGT, but he's there. He's in the LHL now, and BG was part of the NAGT, and he would have made it regardless, you know, stuff like that. But um, but I think um, there's a difference between overall, making it and being a good player too, right? There's a difference between just yeah. being in the LHL and being a good LHL player. I mean, I I really do think it was. Successful. I couldn't. I wasn't. I don't have the greatest track record with goalies. Narg was going to be a successful player anyway. Um, but like, we, really, when you look at it, you got BG, IC, Stamkos, Austin, and Legendary Trev, all successful, sound starters in the LHL. Berth um, is now a starter this season too. Oh, is he? Yep. Um, and uh, Omaha made it up there. Yep. Um, and so, you know, like a, a lot of those guys, even if they were going to make it, like I think it um, it sped up their development, gave them the puck touches, gave them the experience against that talent that they needed to. I mean, it's a tough, it's a tough setting to be in. You're basically taking all the guys who are trying to break into the league and playing them against five guys who are in the league already. Um, and that was kind of uh, helped out a little bit by people playing their backups and stuff against the NADT. But, um, and, and being blown out always sucked. But overall, I think it really was successful, shown by the fact that almost 90% of the players made it as starters um, the very next season that was, uh, I believe. Or maybe it was two seasons from then. I think, yeah, two seasons later, they were all 90% success rate. And like one of the only guys that didn't, he just, I think, who was it? Um, not Big Bertha, but the other, I don't even know. Spider what, Geek. Yeah, yeah, because uh, Spider Geek was a really good player, but he just uh, never quite um, put the time not in after. The same way. Yeah. Yeah, and so, um, so I mean, considering that, I think, I think it was a, if you talk to the players who were in it, I'd say they would speak fondly of their time. Uh, in the NAGT, say that it was helpful, and I think that's all that really matters. If they think it was an important part of their development, then it was, um, and it was successful. And hopefully, um, considering I think wasn't that year really bad in terms of losing players. So like I think it was really integral that we got those players uh, the, developed. The follow, yeah, the following year, uh, over the following two seasons, actually, we did lose a, a decent number of players. We had some older ones come back to as well, which which definitely helped. But there were openings that were made by players who stepped away from the game, whether permanently or, or for a couple seasons. So. Yeah. So I mean, I think it was successful. Some people might other might say otherwise, but but generally, um, you know, it gave them a taste of playing. A lot of those guys said stuff like, "Oh, I've never, I've never gotten the experience to like play under, like pl uh, play and under a strategy before, play under a general manager who actually like kind of knows how to b put a team together." Like that's the kind of feedback that I would get. So, like, and that is also another reason why I stepped away from GM. Wasn't it that season that I said I'm not going to be a GM, but I'm going to do this instead? Yeah, you did that um, ABT instead. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think it was successful and. 
Um, it was kind of tough at times, kind of exhausting, especially after playing like a, a game and then having to like rush in there and be like, hey, sorry guys. Like, so it was hard. And those guys were all really understanding. Um, some of the guys that didn't make the team weren't as understanding, but um, that's okay. And I think it made them feel better about it. And I know back in the day when I originally tried the national development team, I think it was like the North American, whatever, or United States, yeah. I don't remember. North but American. I remember you said something along the lines of like when you first heard that, you were so excited and it made you want to play the game more. It made you want to practice and develop yourself yep. because of that. So then, like, that's that's just like it's it's all relative and something to um, strive for. Yeah, it's it's all about get providing inspiration to the players to want to get better and to make them think like that they actually have a chance to get into the like to to have somebody come to you and say I think you're a special player. Like that was huge for Stamkos cuz at the time he was a backup in the RSL and I told I came to him and I told him I think you can be an LHL starter in one season. I think you can be an LHL starter next season. And he was. <laughs> and he made it. And he was like, are you serious? Because right now I'm a backup in the RSL. And I told him, I've seen the, the way that you play and the amount of your passing ability, and I know for a fact that you can make it in the LHL. And I think to have someone say that to him made him like the game, made him enjoy the game more, and made him have more confidence, which, so, I mean, I don't know what, I don't know what kind of a player those players would have been without the NAGT. I'm not going to sit here and say, like, I made them all, like, but I think I at least can say that I had a positive impact on it, so... So you made the NADT to sort of help bridge the gap between players in the RSL and then players in the LHL and sort of adjusting for the differences in how the game is played at an LHL level versus how the game is played at an RSL level. So given that, do you believe that the RSL and the JSL are successful as they are right now? Um, I guess it kind of depends on what the end goal, what the what the goal of the RSL and the JSL is. If the goal of it is to provide an environment for those players below the A league to play, then yeah, absolutely. If the goal of it is to develop those players to the best that they can be, um, I think there's a little bit left there to be desired. And I think maybe it's just not everyone is like you and me and Leafs and other guys like that who want to be the best player that they can be. Some of the guys just want to play in a league and have fun and whatever happens, happens. And so you need a league for those people too. Um, but like, I really think that there are players who could be better, um, who weren't better because of the format that the RSL and the JSL provided the environment between general managers and just management who was eligible for play like season what was it season 12 you had drag who was on my team a starter he was my general manager and he was also starting in the rsl and he led he was on the top 10 in scoring i think in the lhl or at least up there maybe he wasn't top 10 but he was he was up there as a starter and then he would go and play in the RSL. I, like there were there were flaws with management and everything, and I don't know what I I don't know what I expect. It was just like this this perfect management like we got from you and Cap and Taze. Um, but I think I don't know that it was successful in developing players the way it should have been. But you know. So basically, it depends on what you define as success for the RSL and the JSL. If you define it as preparing players to get to an LHL level, then you find it to be not very successful. But if its uh, if its purpose is more to provide a place for people who aren't at an LHL caliber to play in a competitive environment still, then it is successful. Yeah, that's fair okay. to say. Okay. All right, so we'll shift on away from that then um so, <laughs> so i'm actually looking forward to the answer to this one will you come back again as a player oh uh, geez i don't know i don't know it's gonna be a decision 
it's kind of hard. Maybe I can't like definitively say yes or no. Uh, I can't say that I, I won't come back. I certainly that's something that I miss, but I'm also kind of I was kind of blindsided by how easy easily I forgot about it, and how easy it was to be able to like not have to worry about it when yeah. you're like out with friends and having to be like oh I've got to I've got to go do this thing at six thirty like it was always just such a pain and then you go and a team forfeits or you lose six nothing and it's like great and then you call your friends back up and they're like oh you know like it was just such a pain and so like that convenience of this past season has been so nice and not having to worry about it not having to stress about maintaining your skill and practicing all the time so there's pros and cons um but i do i can certainly say that i miss the high competitive play and pubs certainly don't give it to you so um I don't know. I can't say that I'm going to come back. I can't say that I won't. Kind of, it depends on certain stuff. Generally, I think I kind of always said, like, as long as I'm single, I'll be playing <laughs> NHL. <laughs> uh, so we'll see about that. Would you consider coming back as a GM, like, non-playing, or as uh, maybe, like, I guess technically GMing an NADT? Um... Mm. Yeah, but I feel like the problem would be I would always want to play. I'd want to play in the game. Be like, oh, can I, can 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 I, can I, can I zip? <laughs> and so then that would like get really annoying. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, I was just curious if if that would be more likely of a scenario for you than uh, than coming back as a player. So I think it'd be more likely that I sign up again. Uh, as a player than as a GM? More likely that I sign up again as a player than sign up as a non-playing GM. Yeah. But not writing off player GM. Okay. That's all I can say. All right. <laughs> well, something to look forward to for the future. So. All right, so what would you say has been the defining moment of your 13-season career? Um. Oh, geez, there's a couple of things. I mean, always, always enjoyed season four, but no one remembers it. Always enjoyed season five because people started. <laughs> season five was the year everyone accused me of hacking <laughs> as a goalie, um, but we didn't win a, we didn't win the cup or anything, and I faltered at the very end. And then everyone called me like hacks, hacks. Is like every time it'd be like you know how in the LH, in the NHL when a goalie allows a goal or a couple goals they go flurry, flurry or whatever yeah. they chant their name. Yep. Um, instead they would chant hacker, hacker <laughs> in the chat whenever I gave up a goal. So that was always fun of being so. It gave me so much confidence being so good that people actually thought you were hacking it was just like unreal. But um. It probably wouldn't be goaltending. I mean, season seven was was absolutely awesome, breaking save percentage records and that kind of thing. But for me, the single most defining moment we didn't even win the cup that, that year, but would have been season twelve Boston. Um, season ten Boston. Season, sorry, season ten. Ugh, season ten Boston. Um, we lost to what the Edmonton Oilers in the finals. In the finals, yeah. But in the semifinals, we played Washington. And we absolutely should have lost. I think at the very end we led the series. We led in a game, cumulatively led the score, like what four and a half minutes cumulative. Maybe, yeah. And we won four games out of seven <laughs> uh, with tying. Uh, but game seven, um, the puck came out from the slot with exactly five seconds left. And I just, I think I shot a grounder and it somehow found the twine <laughs> to tie the game. It was my second goal of the game of a 2-2 game and we won in overtime. Um, and that was probably like the most defining. That was when I just felt like absolutely on top of the, on top of the, not world, but you know, on top of the LHL and um, that one I'll never forget. Just like finishing the game seven and just like, just fist pumping you know so 
that was that's got to be the most defining i hope that defines my career if that doesn't define it i guess maybe that probably that probably outdoes my career to be honest <laughs> that was so just... is that what you hope people remember you for yeah i mean i'm not sure how many people remember it other than me but <laughs> uh, just abs- i remember absolutely just felt so dominant after that game it was so much fun to to play like that and i can only imagine how the other side of that because i just felt like pure elation after tying that game god to to lose that lead would have been miserable in game seven especially considering we only led for like they absolutely washington capitals absolutely dominated us that series but yeah so that would be most defining my favorite that would be my favorite that's what i'll say i don't know if i could say that defines my career but um that was my favorite lhl memory so which personal success, and this can be a memory like that, like a specific game, it could be winning a, a cup, winning a specific award, whatever the case is, uh, which personal success that you achieved during your career means the most to you? Um, Probably MVP season, what was that, season 12 or season 11? Season 12. Season 12 MVP, because like I tried so hard. <laughs> I was a try hard and to get that kind of, to get that recognition was something that I would never get. And I know, I think was it like Crab's team was really salty that, that the MVP went to the fourth seeded team, but like it was something that I would never, I never thought that I'd actually be recognized for being MVP, but leading the, leading my team in scoring as a left defenseman was like, I don't know. I That's probably my most proud moment of just trying so hard and doing everything I could for that team um, to make us successful. So that was got to be probably my, I don't remember, like, I don't miss that season, but there was a certain freedom of being the go-to guy for a team and being able to have such a long leash with the puck and being able to try certain things to be like I led the team in scoring, but I also freaking touched the puck a hell of a hell of a lot more and my teammates allowed me to do a lot of stuff and set me up a lot of a lot of the times. They'd always bring it back to the point and that kind of thing. So that MVP year was something. Especially on a a, a team like with very little like I didn't have obviously I didn't have dial or you know, I didn't have somebody like that that I could just go to. I was the go to guy and somehow we still made the playoffs, which was just like Try like, I don't know, I'm really proud of that. For sure. All right. So on the flip side of the coin, what is the biggest regret of your career? Oh God, my biggest regret. Um, I remember season nine when I had Lucic and Leafs on my team. I think. Yep. We were in the finals. We got swept, but it wasn't that that I regret. Um, and I don't even know. This is, might not even be my answer, but I remember having the puck, and my ping was so bad at home that I would have to go over to the rink and play in the press box. And I would, <laughs> so I'd go in over there and, and plug into the Ethernet. No, I wouldn't even plug. I would connect wirelessly. And so, because I was wireless, occasionally my screen would just freeze. I remember we were struggling in the series so badly. We were playing this absolutely stacked team. I don't remember who was on it, but they were much better than us, even though we had Lucic, me, Leafs, and someone else. And um, and so I, we think we had Trev, legendary Trev. Um, Good guy on the team, too. Yeah. And I so, think Meatsell. Yeah, it was that game when we had Guy, um, I think. No, maybe not. It might not have been that game, but I think it was game three, and... The puck came back to me with like 30 seconds left in the game, and I went to play it on my backhand, and my screen just froze. And I was like, oh no. And I knew that I was going to turn it over. And I tried so hard to get rid of it, but it was just too late. And it just, I think it like rolled off my stick, and someone else came in and just scored. And I felt so bad because I was the GM, and I'd been like, I'd been really stern with them, going like, we can't make mistakes. We can't make any mistakes. They, we cannot afford to make mistakes. We're we are not good enough of a team. They are too good. We need to have the perfect game. And we finally did. <laughs> and then I had the game losing turnover. And it wasn't even like it was my fault, but it wasn't. You know, I tried to 
obviously I was trying to do stuff with the puck. I wasn't just trying to fling it. And if I just flung it into the zone, then it wouldn't have happened. But if my internet didn't freeze, then it wouldn't have happened either. And you know, we got swept. We would have lost anyway. But I think we would have won that game had if I hadn't have turned that over. And that was, I still remember that single moment. I'm sure Leafs probably remembers it too, because it was like, oh, how can, I, like, how do you, what do you say after that as the as the team leader, and then you turn it over, and it's like, oh, how can this end like that? No, not like that. We played such a good game. But I will say that my actual biggest regret would have been not breaking the assist record. Although that memory, Season like, 10. is, like, I'll always forget that single memory, but not breaking the assist record when I came so close, because I know I'll never be that close again. And I know, like, I choked. <laughs> Did I have 32 and I needed 34? I had 33 and I needed 34? I tied it. 33. Yeah, so I tied, tied the record it, but didn't instead break of it. beating it. Uh, yeah, so that's. Needed one more assist, and it'd be my name in lights, and, you know. At least you got the goal record, but no. Well, Crab went on to smash the assist record and had 37 in one season in season yeah, 12. So, but at the end of the day, I would have had it though. Yep, you would have for, for a while. You would have two years, two seasons. So, so this kind of goes along with that. Maybe this is the same answer. But is there anything else you wish you had accomplished in your career? Um. I guess, I mean, not really. Like, I would have loved to be a successful forward, but I don't feel that bad about not hitting it. I mean, most things I'm pretty satisfied with. I wish I had three-peated, but <laughs> can you really complain that much? Yeah. Um, You know, uh, I wish I had won the GM award more than just once. <laughs> kind of funny that, that I ended up, only ended up winning it once despite being in the finals four times out of four times. Um. Uh, but you know, I don't have that many things I regret just because I was pretty lucky. I'd have a really successful LHL career, so I don't know how much I would change. You know? Yeah. All right. So, was there ever a role model you look up to as a player? Probably, I would assume this would come from like early on your career or maybe when you switched positions there was somebody you looked up to sort of for uh influence or, or guidance somebody you tried to model your play after um you know it's kind of like asking gretzky who he looked up to <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i remember very early on one of the first players that i ever played with was dopey g and i remember he was always like i was really shitty obviously and he was better than me but like I remember passing with him, and and actually having like a really good time just passing the puck back and forth because back then it was just everyone was flailing and gliding the puck in and that kind of thing. So to experience like that actual team play is probably one of the reasons why I stuck with the game. Um, and so I always kind of looked up to him as a defenseman. Um, but then at, you know at at a certain stage you kind of overshadow and forget about that. Um, and then once I became a goalie, like I looked up to Ticklebox originally because like. I was just amazed by his hand eye. And then eventually I was able to do it with myself and I wasn't quite as amazed and now he's kind of take you know, he's kinda of washed up, so <laughs> <laughs> um but uh then from then it was Taze because I was always just astonished by like I remember asking him once like Taze, teach me how to play D and he was like, It's easy dude, just just defend <laughs> and I was like, What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> and then eventually it kinda of clicked. But I remember watching videos of Taser play, trying to figure out like how he positioned as a defenseman, because it was something that I wanted to do so bad, but never felt like I could actually skate, and never felt like, uh, like, I felt like it was on a completely different level. Do you remember the the friend, uh, international friendly series that we played against Russia? Yep. Yep. When it was a four v four, and the team was it was it you and Matt on offense? Yeah. And Taze on D, and then I was in net. God, that was quick touch on that because most people don't even know about that i wonder if you have it recorded or anything but it's probably somewhere yeah what do we call it like the friendly series or, or yeah it was like a show match i think it's just an na versus russia show match might have been like the friendship or it was friendship it wasn't cup the friendship else. cup that was yeah. that was different yeah so but that was to this day the hardest game i've ever played hardest cup series of games i've ever played 
and I felt so terrified to play the puck. I remember just pushing the puck out to Taze and be like, Taze, I trust you with this. Take care of this. Because I could not play the puck because the ping was so high. And I was just absolutely amazed at how Taser still could. And all I could do was stop the puck occasionally. <laughs> it was so difficult. And I still, I think I played actually really good for for being on like 300 or something ping. I can't remember. I was in Minnesota, so Russia is pretty far away. Poland or wherever We were playing it on, I think, Borktown, which was in Germany. Yeah. So, but yeah, Taser, um, as a defenseman, I looked up to a lot until he, he got washed up too. Everyone gets washed up eventually. So. All right. So along sort of the same lines, uh, who was your favorite player at any point in your career uh, to play with or to watch play? Um, It's different. So watch play has got to be Matt. There's just no question about that. The stuff that he can do is just ridiculous. And even though I wish he just would simplify his game sometimes and just I imagine what kind of a player he would be if he would just tried really hard and was like you and just shot the puck whenever he wanted, like whenever, you know, didn't try to be fancy. But he's so creative and so just amazing to watch play. He's just like freaking incredible with the puck. So Matt to watch, absolutely. But to play with, it's got, it's got to be you, Dale. <laughs> <laughs> um, just the chemistry that we had uh, and to be able to always look up and see you streaking somewhere, open ice, and be able to hit that up. Uh, so many good plays that we connected for. So, um, so to it'd be, it'd be you. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> oh man. All right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I definitely miss it too. I'll be honest. I miss it too. A lot of that was like you take it for granted while it's happening. Like I remember us getting so upset when we'd like lose a game or something like that in reality <laughs> we're always one of the best teams but it's like getting upset when we lose a game and now looking back it's like man i don't know why i was ever annoyed at anything <laughs> while playing on that team because like <laughs> i'd fucking kill for that right about now so one of those where like you don't really appreciate what you had until it's gone you know yeah so yeah. And it kind of, I mean, it's kind of the same thing with just the community in general. Like, I think you have a much better appreciation for the community and, and everything that it means and what we've developed here than a lot of people who are still here and active and playing uh, sort of appreciate it for because you know what it's like to not have it and to remember what it was like to have it. I mean, it, it, it's a big difference. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember just getting home from classes and getting on HQM or getting on TS and just every every afternoon and just turn around baseball and <laughs> all kinds of just good times so all right last question what would you change about the game itself the game itself yes so not the lhl but hqm oh geez um i didn't tell you about this one ahead of time so i know but i i've thought about it obviously a lot I would love, and I know this this kind of has been bounced around a bit, but maybe other people haven't thought about it. I would love stick to stick physics to be able to lift sticks would just add such an extra layer of defense, as well as this one's obvious, but puck body collision. But I think at the same time that would change the game too much. But to be able to have a full stick um, of collision at least, and stick to stick stick whoa stick to stick collision <laughs> um be really fun and add add an extra layer of stick lifts and be able to battle with someone in front of the net for for you know to be able to just freaking pin someone's stick down as they're trying to tip it'd be so much fun defense would just be totally different um and and then on top of that, all the other ideas I think are pretty stupid, like sprinting and and what it, hustle should never no um, other other stuff, puck body collision. Maybe if you made the skaters really smaller and the goalies bigger, that would maybe work. Um, but that was always the concern is maybe it would change the game too much. Um, I would love to make the rink bigger so that way we can play a 6v6. I know we don't really have enough players for it, but in the perfect world where we did, 6v6 would be so much fun. I think it would change change the game. And also, I would love offsides 
and maybe even icing that would be really fun to be able to turn on and off um and honestly this one's no one will ever agree with me on this but i would love to play the game without a map i think it would just be so much different and so much more fun like you'd have to be constantly like, like honestly try playing a pub and turn off your map and just try like making a breakout pass or try like trying to find like it would change the game so much. I still, I've been wanting, I've been saying this for like three years, but I would love to play a full four five v five game where everyone has to play without their maps, just to see what it would be like. Because it'd be so entertaining having to like carry the puck and then having to like freeze your stick and look to your right, or like even pressing E to look to your right and figure out who's on the two on one with you and you see if you have a guy open, or having to like having to skate back for a puck in the corner and turn around and see what your gap is like. Like I would just. It would be so much more, feel more like hockey because I feel like the map is just, um, but I've made a lot of good passes based on my map, so I'll take it. But I think that would be such a different, and I wish you could just play different servers with different settings. Icings, this server, offsides and icings, this server, no map server, hardcore mode, like, you know. That is something we're, we're getting <laughs> close to being able to do, actually, with a lot of things like that. Like, I think icing and offsides, either... Is it offsides that I think? One of them, we definitely have a mod that'll yeah. do it. Yeah, um, we have a bot or something. Offside, yeah. it spams it, but yeah. it's not... It's kind of... It sometimes it's good. force it, yeah. yeah. So, there are things like that. Um, and puck body collision is another one, but obviously the concern with it always being mods is that mods aren't necessarily consistent or reliable every time. Yeah. So it's like then you gotta establish a set of rules around what happens if mod fails. So like the common one is the puck body collision for the goalies. That's something that does exist, but it hasn't always been the most consistent of things. Yeah, and um, there's always weird. been some issues with it. Yeah, and it does it the, the way it bounces is kind of strange. So there'd be a whole lot of you, you know, just as like glitch goals too. There'd be a whole mm -hmm. lot of like, oh well, this puck should have hit my body and bounced out, but it didn't. And it's like, well, where do you where do you draw the line on those things, and how do you how do you rule on those things? And it just invites a, a whole lot more controversy, which, at least in my opinion, I'm not sure that the game needs. But it would be fun to experience the game with things like that, like icing, like offsides, like stick-on-stick -stick collision, like puck-body collision, like a bigger rink, uh, or any mix of them together. Yeah, and I love, if you've ever played like late-night hockey or, or anything, um, if you've never <laughs> had a ref, it's kind of like a role-play almost, where you play a 4v4 or somebody, and somebody goes, I'm the ref. And then you just call discretionary penalties, like interference, high sticking and stuff. And every time they got to go get off the ice and pretend to be in the penalty box. That's really fun. I don't know if it would ever be good for competitive play because it'd be like you'd have to watch where you high stick your. <laughs> and it's like obviously high sticking doesn't do anything. You know, interference should be a penalty, which because there's sometimes like oh, ants and deants and that kind of thing. That'd be fun to play, have that in the competitive play. Um, but if you never played that, I would love to play icing, offsides, penalties, and no map. I think that would be the full experience. But um, and then also another thing I was kind of thinking about like a, a while back. Um, I would love to have it to where, as a goalie, if when you set G, you have a button and you can press maybe like F or E, to where when the puck hits your stick, if you time E, try pressing the, whatever key it is correctly then you can hold on to the puck and freeze it and then you can have a, a face off in the defensive zone um that's actually love, a really good idea i would love that to where it would add an extra layer to where then you have rebound control as well as freezing the puck so you know obviously you can flick it out on a save but that's pretty hard you have to time it correctly um but for goalies like for me i was always a a stationary um block style goalie you have guys like i think pk is more of like a a, a flail goalie Sounds bad when you say it like that, but like a swing, a swinger goalie. There's other goal. You probably have better examples than I do. Sammy, right? Sammy was backhand swing. Um, whereas I was always just a standstill and track the puck into my stick and catch it, basically. Yeah. And if if I had the ability to press E every time the puck hit my stick and it would stick to it, and you could freeze it or you could play it, like that would be so sick. Um, so that's kind of a couple of things that I would change about the game, but some people wouldn't like it. Some people would, I think generally you'd make a better, a better competitive experience, but you know. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, I I look at uh, to get away from the word flailer there. I call them swipers usually. <laughs> Goalies that swipe at the puck a lot. Yeah, uh, swing like Mitzel. Mitzel is swiper. He'll, he'll swing at it a lot. So yeah. And that would be something that if you were to include the ability to freeze the puck, you definitely wouldn't want to do that. You'd want to default to blocking it, which would be a pretty big stylistic change for a lot of goalies because there tend to be more swipers or swatters or flailers, whatever you want to call them, than just <laughs> straight up, I guess, blockers. Hard to really describe it, but yeah. Because blockers, right. the problem is they would always roll into your net if you didn't yep. block you correctly. Careful. So. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, that concludes the interview. So thank you very much, Del, for yeah. agreeing to be a part of this and Thanks sitting for... around for it was an hour and 15 minutes. So oh, a little geez. longer than I was aiming for, but that you know, it wasn't the three hours that most podcasts turned into. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's... So that's that's good. I think generally is entertaining. A little pick my brain and maybe some people you can skip around find something that entertains you more. Whatever. Yeah, I hope so. I'm gonna um I'm gonna try to include uh, timestamps of the different questions so that people can take a look at specifically what your response was to the questions that I did ask you here and hopefully we'll get some feedback on this and if people like it then we'll go ahead and do it again with some other people in the future and I won't rule out doing a second one with you. We there's plenty more in your career and we could talk about the future of HQM two or why the game is the way it is. There's plenty of stuff we could get into, so I won't rule out having you back on for a second round at some point. So Yeah. Yeah, thanks, thanks for thanks for having me on. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for hope, anyone. Uh, who... Hope everyone enjoys it. Yeah, thanks for anyone who actually made it to the end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Alright. Have a good one man.